If you enjoy the content on this channel, then you no doubt have a passion for true crime and mystery. I myself, for years, have thought about finding a clue or overlooked piece of information that would crack a cold case wide open. And while that hasn't happened yet, I can still get that feeling thanks to the sponsor for today's video, Hunt a Killer. You have probably heard of them, and for good reason. But if this is your first time, allow me to explain the treat that you can be in for. Hunt a Killer is a box set that has you playing lead detective to help solve a cold case. With each box, the ongoing story is unfolded, and you are tasked with coming to police records, coroner's reports, witness testimonies, and so much more in an attempt to solve a case that is by no means simple. It's the perfect idea for a date night with your special someone, a great way to have fun with friends over drinks, or it can even be done solo if you're the renegade detective type. Each box comes with extremely detailed and authentic pieces to really throw you into the atmosphere. I'm not even joking, I was playing one of the box sets and I completely forgot that this was a game, due to the fact that I am learning information about suspects from handwritten letters and reading a death report that is so detailed I couldn't even tell if it was real or fake. So, if this sounds like your idea of a fun time, you will also get the added bonus of knowing that you will be part of a community with over 100,000 active members. And to top it off, part of the proceeds go to the Cold Case Foundation. This is honestly a game that was made by true crime lovers for true crime lovers. Right now, you can go to huntakiller.com forward slash cadaver and use code cadaver for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use code cadaver for a 20% off discount. But first, you have to ask yourself, do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Since starting this channel, I have covered a wide range of different people, both good and bad. But for today's video, I wanted to cover someone who could be debated on if they were in fact a bad person, or just someone who was pushed to their brink and felt that they had no other choice. I am referring to a Reddit user going by the handle SpecialNeedsDevil1 and her post that she made to the r slash confession board where she told a story of how her life had spiraled and become filled with misery and emptiness. How she felt that she had no other option, and had to make a choice that she felt was an easy choice to make, but knew that it would be a choice that people would judge her over. This is the story of Special Needs Devil 1, and shows that truly everyone has their breaking point. I'm putting my extremely, profoundly disabled seven-year-old into a residential facility so I can forget he exists. I'm not sorry. I can't tell anyone this, even my therapist. Lambus me if you want, and maybe even I deserve it. I only ask what you would do if you were in my situation, not what you think people should do, what you would really do. I'm a single mom of two boys, 12 and 7. My husband passed away three years ago in a work accident. A very large portion of me believed that it was suicide. I can't see him ever making the mistake he made that caused his death. And he had taken an action just before, that which ensured his co-workers weren't in the room. I fully believe he killed himself because of our younger son and no one will ever change my mind. We were told when I was pregnant that he would have Down syndrome. We could handle that, even if it was severe. It turned out that he had a chromosome deletion. His disorder is kind of rare, so I won't post about which specific one, but suffice to say, he'll never be anything more than he is now, or has ever been. And what he is, is nothing. He doesn't appear to have any awareness and never has. 
His eyes are locked into one position. He doesn't respond to noise, touch, or pain. He is total care. He is capable of nothing. He is tube fed and on oxygen. He is in diapers and will be forever. He makes no sounds, no attempts to communicate. He never really even cried as a baby. He has never made an attempt to interact with anyone or his environment. I'm not upset because I got a special needs imperfect child. I feel the way I feel because this thing takes up 200% of my time and does nothing. I didn't get an imperfect child. I didn't get a child. I don't love him. He doesn't have a personality. There is nothing to love. And yet I'm responsible for him. In addition to his extreme delays, he's also medically fragile. Respiratory crisis, fecal impactions, his automatic nervous system doesn't function properly, issues with his G-tube, infections, pressure sores, no matter what we put him on or how we position him. Our older son has suffered because his non-existent brother has colored everything in his life. He's had medical care get delayed because there's only one of me and his brother is more critical. We do have a visiting home nurse, but only 20 hours a week and we aren't eligible for more. I was starting law school. I gave up my dreams and my plan for my children for this potato. My older son can't do a lot of things that he wants to do because of the younger's need for care and appointments. The final straw was I heard a sound. I went into younger son's room to check, thinking that he had forgotten how to breathe again, and saw older son hitting him and screaming, you are why I don't have a mother. You are why I don't have a father. You are why I can't have any friends over. You are why I can't be in sports. I didn't ask for you, and I hope you die. Instead of being horrified, I watched. And my younger son just did not react. No signs of pain or fear or upset. No reaction at all. He breathes, but he is not alive. He doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know who older son is. He has no sense of self, life experience, or awareness of his surroundings. He doesn't need to be in my home. He doesn't know or care where he is. He is genetically my son, but he is not family. My previously abused brain damaged cat who can't walk straight has more of a personality and is far more lovable than my child. In fact, I was looking forward to raising a Downs baby, even one with severe impairments for that reason. With disability can come gifts. This boy is not a gift. He is a genetic mistake I probably should have miscarried and would have definitely terminated if I'd known he would be like this. And the flip side is, if he has awareness, he's miserable. And there is nothing I can do. If he has likes and dislikes, no one knows what they are. If he is in pain, he can't tell anyone. If he wants anything, he can't communicate. He's had every imaginable therapy. Nothing has made a difference. And so he's leaving our home on the 29th. I feel excited and relieved and then guilty because I know we will be happier with him gone. He's already taken my husband and my son's father. He was working so, so much overtime to pay for the cucumbers care for the experimental therapies insurance wouldn't cover because this one was going to be the breakthrough. He was tired and defeated and disappointed. He sought counseling as well, but I don't think he could ever say the words, I don't want my son in my home either. He's ruined my older son. I'm so wrapped up on the younger, I never really realized how ignored and damaged he was. He lost his father too. I didn't just lose my husband. He is my priority now, and this malignant lump can be someone else's problem. At least they'll be paid a wage to care for him. At least they'll get a break from when they went to punch out. I just never want to think of him again. 
and I'm not sorry. And for that, I'm sorry. Thanks for reading. Okay, so obviously that was a lot of information to take in. And I'm sure by this point, you all are feeling a range of emotions. Some of you are probably disgusted by Opie's actions, some of you are probably fuming and angry, and others are probably confused and torn on how to feel. No matter what anyone is feeling, do not feel guilty for how you feel because they are your emotions and nobody can tell you that you are wrong. There is a lot to unpack here, so let's start with the overall subject matter. OP has a disabled son who requires constant 24-7 care. Obviously, her son will never be able to do the normal things that we would be able to do, like getting a job, going to school, moving out, and finding their own path in life. Instead, her son will, for the rest of his life, be fully dependent on the care of another person. That, in and of itself, is a monumental task and something I feel a lot of people are not going to realize at first that for the remainder of your life, you will be responsible for the care of this individual. You have to dress, bathe, feed, and care for them every day until either you or they die. Now, while you will have to keep that in the back of your mind, you will also have to take into account that she is his mother. I am no parent, but most any will tell you that from the moment your child is born, hell, even when they are growing inside of their mother, from those moments a parent would feel this instant and instinctual need to protect and care for their child, regardless of any type of difficulty. The thought of abandoning your own child forever to go and live a normal life is something that wouldn't even be seen as a last option to many parents out there. But I am not saying this to point fingers and call OP an evil person. I truly do not think that it is this black and white, and I think that there is more to the psychology of all of it. I know many will throw her into the category of a heartless mother and be done with it, but hear me out. I should state that this is not me defending her actions. I just think it is important to view this story from all sides instead of the most obvious one. Let's now look at this from her side. For years, she was forced to give all of her attention, love, and care to her son when she had another son to look after, yet she couldn't since her younger one needed her full time. On top of all that, I can only imagine how strained her and her late husband's marriage was. It honestly really stood out to me when she claimed that she felt her late husband's death was not an accident, but instead suicide giving her reasons that it wouldn't have been something that he would have never knowingly done and made sure that he was alone when he did it. She is vague about it, so there is no real way to tell what the manner of death was, and honestly, it's beside the point. But it is important to note that she felt in her heart it was suicide. Could it have been for his son's condition? Maybe. Or it may not have even been a suicide, and could have simply been a work accident and that maybe OP has some kind of tunnel vision here about this whole thing, since she obviously has very strong feelings about why she was leaving her son in a residential facility. So we now begin to see some more of her side of the story, and as we continue picking apart the post, things start to make more sense. She has lost her husband, she feels the care and attention that she is giving her youngest is taking its toll on her both physically and mentally. And on top of that, she hasn't been able to show attention to her oldest, who is starting to lash out because he feels that he doesn't have parents anymore. He lost his father, and now his mother has to wait hand and foot on his youngest brother. To add even more to the mother's reasoning, we need to look at how she began to view her youngest son. She describes him as having no awareness, his eyes locked into one position, he doesn't respond to touch, noise, or even pain, he is tube fed and on oxygen, and he doesn't even make a sound in any way to attempt to communicate. This obviously is by no means the child's fault. 
as it's how he was born, so nobody can blame him for that. The OP, to me it seemed, had since been past the point of being backed into a corner and feeling helpless. She has clearly already made her choice and isn't regretting it. Her oldest son, honestly, is the part that really pulls me in both directions. It is well known that at-home care is extremely expensive, and she does state that she does have it, but for only half of the time, and that unfortunately isn't enough. And she can't afford the cost of a live-in full-time nurse so that she can spend time with her older son. And this is where I'm torn because I would want to have a relationship with my older son as well if I were her. But she no doubt feels guilt over leaving her younger son because he needs constant care. And her being pulled in both of these directions is no doubt a huge factor into why she is even making this choice. Does she focus on her younger son and for sure lose her older? Or does she make the choice of putting her youngest in a care facility? That is the part I have the toughest time grasping. Because I feel like that is the biggest deciding factor for all of this honestly. I think if she only had the one son then she would not even have made this post, let alone even consider the option of abandoning her child. She also made it very clear that she would never visit him because as she previously stated, she doesn't even know if he knows who she is or if he is even able to comprehend anything around him. She even seemed to cross out any possible idea that could have helped. She mentioned the countless therapy sessions they took him to with no help the time she tried balancing being a mom for both of her sons, and that also failed. Could she have done more? And if so, what? Reddit was, for the majority at least, very supportive of her choice. They argued that if her son didn't respond to any type of stimulation or emotion, then was he even living? It could be argued that if someone is on life support, are they even living? How would one define life? Is it the basic idea of simply having the ability to breathe, and that's it? Well, for her son, he couldn't even do that on his own. He required a breathing tube after all, so was her son even living? Do we count life as the memories we make, the growth we accomplish, or do we count it as simply not being dead? It varies, of course, from person to person. As I said, most of Reddit did support her choice and recommended that both her and her oldest son seek therapy for what they had gone through. And it's not a long shot to assume that neither of them had taken any time to grieve for the loss of her husband and his father. I think that for those who would be quick to attack or judge her are not in her position. Now sure, I know that she is most definitely not the only parent to ever have a child with a disability, like her youngest did, but since it is rare, for the majority, parent or not, I would be willing to bet that we don't know the toll it took on her, and that we would be able to say without a doubt that we wouldn't end up making the same choice. This is why the story stood out to me as much as it did, because it really isn't just black and white. There are so many factors to consider in this before even attempting to make a choice. It's something that even the OP admitted when she said that she is sorry that she doesn't feel any remorse for her choice. That is the story of Special Needs Devil 1, and while I know that the comment section is going to be heavily debated after this video, I simply ask that everyone please be respectful and considerate and not attack anyone for their opinions. I know I probably don't even need to say that since this community is very positive and friendly, but I know that this topic is going to cause some controversy. My views on this story are my own, and you shouldn't let it affect how you feel about it. We are all entitled to feel how we want, and nobody can say that what you are feeling is wrong. On a lighter note, I do hope that you all enjoyed this video, and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see you all in the next video. Stay safe out there, friends. Good night.